Typical tech. Typical tech. It's a touchdown, Red Raider. Fantastic. Love it and leave it. And they hail from Lubbock, Texas. That's pure Texas tech. Hello and welcome to another episode of Typical Tech. Glad you could join us. Always happy to bring you some great Texas Tech people, news, and everything else going on in Texas Tech Athletics. And that's all thanks to Jay Ferg Pros, a proud partner of Texas Tech Athletics. When it comes to roofing, construction, and plumbing, don't settle for anything but the best. Contact Jay Ferg Pros, the best solution for your home or business. Again, this is part of the Texas Tech Podcast Network. Uh, subscribe, like us on the uh, podcast network. We're bringing you all sorts of new and interesting content each and every week. In addition to typical tech, we have uh, Scarlet and Black with Hacks. And we talk about, uh, uh, he talks with a lot of former student athletes. Also, we have the Kirby Hokut Show every week. And if you listen, we've got some other uh, great games from our past uh, is all part of the Texas Tech Podcast Network. We'd like to bring you some trivia. And guess what? We have two great guests today. We have Texas Tech basketball coach Chris Beard. And also, how about this? Texas Tech president Lawrence Skubinek. We'll hear from uh, both of those fine Red Raiders. But in honor of Coach Beard being on, we have a trivia question related to Coach, coach Chris Beard. So think about this. How many wins over top 25 opponents has Chris Beard racked up as part of the Texas Tech coaching staff? So think about that. Chris Beard, top 25 opponents while on the Texas Tech coaching staff. We'll give you the answer uh, when we come back. We had a really great week last week. We had the virtual Reckham Tour, which came to you live last Thursday night into your homes. We had Kirby Hoka. We had Tim Tadlock. We had Coach Beard. We had Coach Wells. We also had Brittany Brewer on and three great Red Raiders, Grant Gilbert, William Clark Green and Josh Abbott. We brought that to you live last Thursday night, the virtual Reckham Tour. More than 30,000 Red Raiders have partook and listened and watched that. We had some uh, prize winners. Uh, hopefully all the prize winners have been notified as of today. But how about that? At one time, we had all these Red Raiders from across the world. We had South Korea, we had Italy, we had people all across the country listening in and watching to the virtual Reckham Tour. That, is typical tech. Wished we had had a great run in April, March and April with Texas Tech basketball. Think about the last two years. Went to the Elite Eight two years ago, uh, lost to Villanova, the eventual national champion winner. And then of course, last year in Minneapolis, made it all the way to the national championship game before losing a heartbreaker in overtime against Virginia. People have been clamoring. When are we going to have Coach Chris Beard on typical tech? Guess what? Today's the day. Coach, that's, uh, you got a pretty good beard game going there. Is this your first ever official beard? This, this long, yes. Normally after the season, I'll let it go for about two weeks. And then when we have our first kind of recruiting situation, I'll shave it. So I went through the phase where I didn't have much confidence, but my three daughters, Randy, kind of pushed me through, you know. So I'm on the other side now. Um, pretty, pretty good. A lot easier in the mornings, but... Uh, I was eating some chips and salsa the other day and it kind of gets stuck in the mustache part. Not a big fan of that. Yeah. Well, but it's important to have the women in your life like it, right? That's the, that's, that's the key. And uh, so, and you're right, there's a certain point you get to, and then you go, all right, I can go with this thing. Yeah. If the four women in my life uh, are on board, then I don't really question it much. <laughs> so uh, how you been we talked a couple weeks ago uh, on Kirby's show. How, how you been uh, through this? You're a guy that, that likes to be in control and likes to have uh, schedules and routines and all this kind of takes you out of your, your routine a little bit. Yeah. So we've all been asked that question. Uh, you know me, Gio, I'm not really politically correct. So I'll just, shoot you. Uh, I, I'm miserable, man. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm bored. I miss basketball. I miss the players. Um, my relationship with Mark Adams has never been stronger because I only see him about once every two weeks. So that's been good but I'm sure he feels the same way about me. So no problem there. Uh, I miss going to the movies. Uh, I miss going to Mexican restaurants. I miss drinking draft beer with my friends. Um, I miss seeing my mom and dad. Uh, I'm, I'm tired of television. You know, I'm not a big TV guy, but in this whole deal, we've been watching a little bit more television than normal. I'm, I'm kind of tired of television. Uh, but above all, man, I just miss basketball. I, I miss being on the floor with our players. Uh 
so not being a television guy, has there been something you've watched and said, hey, this kind of changes my mind. This is pretty good television. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the only show I've ever really watched was Breaking Bad, and I got that done throughout the last couple seasons. And so uh, I got such a high standard of TV because I think that's, like, the best ever. But we watched uh, Ozark during oh, this yeah. quarantine time. Good stuff. Uh, I've been known to kind of doze off for a nap from time to time. And when I come back, I really don't rewind much. I just keep going. And so Ozark, it's challenging, man. You, you miss 10 or 15 minutes here or there. You have no idea what's going on. But I, I like that. Uh, I, I will admit I did watch The Tiger King. Okay. That's, uh, you know, I just – Got to be careful what I say about that, but I think anybody that's watched The Tiger King understands what I'm saying. Um, I guess I was kind of addicted to it by the end, which is kind of an embarrassing statement. Um, but I, I did kind of binge watch that one. Um, obviously, I'm watching the, the Bulls, Michael Jordan deal yeah. on Sundays. You know, that's special. I never really thought of it, but that's really kind of the generation I grew up in. You know, like all the games and the scenes I kind of remember watching. So, um, but yeah, I'm tired of television. Hey, who who was your favorite NBA team growing up? You're a Texas guy, so were you a Spurs, Mavs, Rockets guy? Yeah, big time Mavericks. You know, and the Rolando Blackman, Derek Harper, Roy Tarpley, Sam Perkins. Uh, that was kind of my team because we didn't have cable television back in those days, but the Mavericks games would play on on regular TV. And then from time to time, my dad would take me. We'd sit up in the nosebleeds and watch the games. Uh, then, like most kids in that generation, you know, when Jordan came along, it was kind of a game changer. Uh, but if I had to say who my team was, it was the Mavericks. You, you know, that's the interesting thing about Jordan, I think, because he came along at a time, too, when WGN had all those games and people had WGN maybe on cable. And so the Bulls became kind of a home it, – it just collided, right? The greatest player maybe to ever play, and then they have it on there. So you got to see almost all their games. No doubt. I mean, I think uh, – a lot of people like myself and my kind of age bracket, we, we literally watched every game Jordan played because uh, they would have the big games, you know, on Sundays or Saturdays on CBS or NBC, whatever it was. And then you could pretty much watch every game on WG. And it's exactly right. And so, um, yeah, it's been cool going back and watch. I've always been a huge Rodman guy too. Like my first year in coaching, I was down in San Antonio and the Spurs practice in our facility at Incarnate Word a lot. So I had a firsthand look at Avery Johnson and, those guys, but Dennis Rodman is somebody I've always just had great respect for. You know, we, we pride ourselves in playing really hard and being unselfish. And I think, uh, you know, he, he, he might have been the guy that played this game as hard as it's ever been played. And obviously he was unselfish to a core, you know, did all the dirty work. Does it interest you from a, a standpoint to see how Phil Jackson handled all these guys? And because clearly you had to have the right guy to ride herd on all those personalities and yeah, I remember reading about Sparky Anderson when he coached when he managed the Cincinnati Reds he's like you're damn right I had different rules for different for different guys and Jackson was pr pretty astute at how he handled those guys yeah I mean he'd been a great player himself and then his uh, coaching background which I've studied you know starting off overseas in professional basketball I think learning the whole uh, kind of egos and the coaching side of it then he coached and won a championship in the, uh, I think it was the CBA at the time, basically today's equivalent of the G League, and then was an assistant coach with Doug Collins, somebody I have a lot of respect for. Um, you know, Doug Collins, one of my all-time heroes in coaching. Cool Texas Tech moment when we played Northwestern a few years ago uh, yeah. at MTE. Coach Collins was at the game, was really yeah. gracious and complimentary of our team, so that was pretty much a personal highlight. But uh, Phil Jackson is one of the first guys that kind of understood this. It's, it's about the players. Uh, and he understood that, you know, I, uh, you know, Rodman taking the 48 hour vacation, <laughs> right. uh, you know, if Keenan Evans, whatever came to me and needed a vacation, I probably would have worked with him. <laughs> yeah. You got, it's like the, uh, you got to know, I mean, Luke Longley is probably not going to get that 48 hour vacation, right? He's got to be at practice and all that, but, but the worm will be ready. Yeah, no doubt. It's been, you know, it's been kind of cool having him in love the last two years. Uh, and so, I had a chance to kind of have a conversation with him uh, last spring when he came, spent some time with him the day before, and uh, just really a, a good dude, man. Humble, um, a big basketball guy. Got to talking to him a little bit about rebounding. You know, the thing about Dennis is very, very smart, like IQ off the charts in terms of basketball intelligence. So we still show our players today clips of Robin rebounding on both ends of the floor. So 
it's been pretty cool to, to spend some time with him the last couple of years. You know, I thought about you on that first episode when they talked about how Phil Jackson gives him a book at the beginning of the year saying this is our theme and everything and the last dance. Uh, and that's kind of what you do, right? At the beginning of the year, you get, you get your guys together and you guys formulate, hey, here's what this season's going to be about. Yeah, no doubt. You know, I think our, uh, our Elite Eight team, the, the theme was finish. We spent a lot of time uh, that year just talking about how to finish a game, how to finish a practice, how to finish a, a possession. And that team embraced it as well as any team has ever embraced one of our themes led by Keenan and Zach and those guys. Uh, and then the final four team, you know, there's consistency. I think we had proven over our first three years that we could compete, but we really wanted to get our guys into a consistency uh, uh, world. Haven't quite set the tone for this upcoming season's team. I think we're going to be so talented and young. I think, um, you know, we're leaning towards just getting back to, like, you know, the day-to-day -day process, uh, thinking much more about each day instead of the, the outcome of the game around the horizon. So, um, but, yeah, every year we try to get a theme and we try to stick to that. It gives the guys some, some consistency as our battle goes on. I know there's no way of knowing, and you probably don't like talking about this, but, you know, you said when you got here, hey, I'm not here to make the NCAA tournament. I'm here to win it every year. And did you kind of feel like with this group and it got taken away from you that you were right there that poised to make a pretty good run this March? Yeah, we really did. Um, I'm not, I'm not saying that we, you know, can predict the future, but I, I can tell you internally we felt really good about where we were at. Um, you know, the last four games of the season, we had a crack at Baylor in Kansas in those – four games and both those teams, as we all know, were good enough to win the national championship last year. We we're right there. One possession game uh, against Baylor on the road in Kansas. We had our chances at home. So going into the big 12, we had a new spirit about us. I think the guys were excited about being there. We had a couple of good practices. We were looking forward to playing in that tournament. Would have took three, three games to win it. And that was our objective. Um, so like, like most teams, everybody can kind of give you a case on why they felt good, but, I just felt that our guys had really come together. I think our uh, our leaders understood what was at stake, and our young guys were excited about getting their first taste of, you know, March basketball. Is there a guy or two you can point back to and say, hey, I, I really came away impressed with how much, maybe even surprised at how much one or two guys progressed over the year? Yeah, I think a lot of our guys had great individual kind of journeys. Uh, you know, one of many, I would say Kevin McCuller. You know, I thought Mac yeah. did a great job. You know, like, it's well documented uh, with Mac having some adversity with the injuries and has never had an off season, uh, including right now with this virus. I know he's back in San Antonio working really hard on his own, but we're hopeful we can get back to normal sooner than later so Mac can basically have his first off season in college basketball. But Mac did last year, which is really difficult to do. He, he improved during the regular season. And then arguably the last eight to ten games of the season, he might have been our best player uh, on both ends of the floor and statistically what he was getting done within his role. So uh, it's no secret not to put all the pressure of the world on him, but he's a guy that we have high, high expectations for moving forward. Uh, but I thought he had a great freshman year, especially considering that he, that he had all that adversity with the injuries. You know, you, you've been great with Zaire and, and Culver. Uh, I know you've been in contact a lot with Jemias about his decision and, and he still has opportunity to come back, but uh, is, is it more difficult because of you can't sit down with the guy with your, in, a, in your office, you got to kind of do all this like zoom and everything, but have you and Jemias had a lot of uh, talks about his future? Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't want to speak for Jemias, but in my view, we're connected pretty strongly and uh, we're both on the same page. Um, you know, I've always thought the college coach's role in this to, is to assist uh, the player, the family, to help them get the information that maybe they can't get on their side. You know, the, the family is going to get a lot of their information from the agent side, which uh, is good. It's good information. It's valid. But as coaches, we can get the information from the other side, from some NBA sources. So I think at the end of the day, what you want is for every kid to make the right decision for them. But to make the right decision, you have to have the information. So. That's basically what we're doing with Ramsey is trying to assist him. Um, then, you know, we've been on the on, on same page from day one. It's not my decision. It's the player's decision with his family. Some guys, you know, want to get drafted. Some guys want to be lottery picks. Uh, some guys want to get some different things done in college before they move on. So there's no right decision. It's the decision that Ramsey wants. 
and whatever he decides, I'll support that completely. And for you, I mean, you can use it, right? Who would have ever thought when you got here, you'd have possibly two one and duns and a two and done in, in Culver. Uh, that doesn't typically happen here at Texas Tech. And it shows two things, A, how you guys recruit, but B, you've really developed these guys when they got here. Cause you know, you know, not all these guys were sought after by everyone and you guys saw something in them and developed them. Yeah, I would agree with you completely, Joe. I appreciate you bringing out both sides of it. First, it's, it's the recruiting piece <clears throat> going back to, you know, Chris Ogden's work uh, with Zaire and Culver is the lead recruiter. Uh, certainly Al Pinkins did some good stuff when those guys were younger as we were developing relationships. Um, and then the job SIP did here as an assistant coach, uh, recruiting, you know, Ramsey is the lead recruiter. And, um, so you, you give credit to the guys that did the work in the recruiting. And then I think equally uh, important is the player development. So whether it be a guy like Zaire that really wasn't a ranked recruit, um, he worked so hard to put himself in a position to be a one and done, huge victory for the program. Whether it be a guy like Culver that was so laser focused on what he wanted to get done. And, uh, he's been so gracious of uh, saying publicly what the program did for him. We're always appreciative of that. It makes us, makes us feel feel good. That's the goal, right? Recruit good players, help them get better. And then most recently with Ramsey, a guy that comes in uh, with the rankings, the five-star reputation, but you still got to prove it on the floor. For him to be an all-conference player his first year, I think a lot of the credit goes to the program and his teammates for that as well. Hey, I don't want to make light of the situation we're going through, but uh, I thought it was funny reading you said, hey, I would have loved to have played in front of no crowds in the postseason because you used to coach in the, in, in the APA. And you've got great stories from, from those days, but th that wouldn't have affected you, right? You said, hey, let's go play with nobody here, 20 people here, right? Yeah, it might have been an advantage for us because we've been there. Not only me, but I think of our staff, Brian Burns with small college experience, Coach Adams, his journey. Um, you know, a lot of guys – when our staff understands that we tell our players all the time, you have to manufacture your own energy and um, you have to earn the crowd's involvement, respect. And, and so I think we were ready for that. It would have been uh, obviously an interesting game. Um, as you know, you know, they let a few people in there, I guess what both teams, 100 or so fans. So I was curious just to see what our Texas tech fans would do, you know, like, you know, the air ball or whatever. I mean, everybody could hear it, you know, so I was telling my good friend Shag, man, like move around a little bit during the game, you know, like, you don't have to stay seated. So um, it, it definitely would have been a wild experience if we would have played that game in front of no fans. Yeah, you know, they say in baseball, five is worse than 5,000, right? Because you just hear whatever thing they're saying. And so you could probably get that same deal. Shag could have really probably gotten under some people's skin because they could hear everything he said. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been a lot of fun. Now, uh, you know, sometimes with coaching, especially the way we kind of coach our guys, it's always best. There's a lot of people in there. Because uh, sometimes we'll have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation in our huddle. Uh, <laughs> right. So I know a couple of our coaches even asked me that the night before, like, Beard, how's this going to go down, man, if there's no no fans in there? So we were uh, planning on really connecting our huddles a little bit tighter and trying to be smart in those moments. Hey, do you like the uh, new floor there in the arena? I do. I uh, really, uh, you know, please, in, in my opinion, we all have different opinions, but I think uh, uh, it's clean. It's, 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 uh, to me, it's just more traditional. I think, uh, you know, with each, each team, the floor has changed a little bit over the years, but, um, uh, I was glad that we got the, the double T on there. You know, I love the old double T and the new double T. So there it was more kind of the fans preference or whatever, uh, but I do like the clean look. I think it's going to be something that our fans take a lot of pride in. Hey, do you have a favorite piece of memorabilia? I see you get a lot there behind you. Is there something that, you know, if you had a fire, you'd go in there and say, Oh, man, that's a great question. I, um, of course, you got a, a good friends, the Ericsons, who overcame that uh, tragedy, the fire this year. Yeah. Was in some conversations with some people around there. It's always kind of uh, one of those cool questions to just sit around and talk about while you're drinking beer with your friends. But, like, when you start talking about all these possessions that we have, what is, you know, more important? I think most people would run in there and, you know, grab your dog. Um, <laughs> I don't have a dog, so um, – that's a good one. I think, uh, you know, one thing that's kind of dear to me is uh, the, the very first paycheck I got in coaching, uh, which wasn't that much. I, I saved the pay stub, and I have that framed. It's, it's kind of a deal where I never forget where I came from. It kind of keeps my chip for me. Uh, but that's one thing of many. Obviously got some pictures of the girls when they were little growing up and stuff that are pretty special to me. 
before they were all online and on your phone and all that right, stuff, just right. old school hard copies. But um, that's it's a, it's a fun. It's kind of not a fun thing to think about, but it's kind of a. It shows you where your priorities are. You know, like I ask the players all the time if you if you had one, you know, one afternoon where you're spending that time. I think it always makes us kind of simplify our thoughts and uh, reminds us of what the most important things in life are. You know, it reminded me a couple weeks ago when you and I talked on the phone and I was at the office and you said, hey, if you knew you only had a couple weeks left, would you be at the office? And that's a great thing to think about, right? You would be probably on the golf course or somewhere else enjoying yourself more than, than sitting up at your desk or something. Yeah, I think the thing I miss most is just people, right? Like, um, that's kind of what it makes the world go around and spending time with the people that you enjoy spending time with. That's why it's been a real challenge uh, in this in this virus. Uh, I got a group of friends, kind of coaching friends and stuff. And we've been doing a little bit of these FaceTimes late at night. We get four or five people's pictures on there. So that's been fun. Um, but I think just like all adversity and all challenges and all bad times in life, something good always comes out of the back end. I think that's the way God kind of set this whole life up for us, in my opinion. And I think uh, – I think the one thing, again, like what we all realize is, you know, how precious our relationships are and the things that we all enjoy doing. And when things get taken from you like they are right now, I think it makes you appreciate them more. And, and technology helps too, right? So you can stay in touch with your girls. And I, I don't know if they're with you or, or if they're, if you're going back and forth, I don't know how that's, how that's working, but I know it's important to you to stay in, in touch with your girls as well. Yeah. Such a different world, right? With FaceTime and text messaging and was just thinking about um, the other day, Eric and I were talking about recruiting and how it's changed. So back before text messaging, it was just like phone calls. And uh, pretty much when you called a recruiter, a parent, or a coach, you had to do a lot for him. It might be on the phone 15, 20 minutes. So, you know, efficiency. Now you can get so much done more with text messaging and emails and this thing. So um, I think I would, I'd like to think that most coaches think we're a lot more productive because of the technology that exists today. Does this downtime help you at all as a coach? Does it make you think, hey, let me try this, or I'm going to uh, – have you had any ideas percolating there that you might try when everyone comes back? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, no different than any offseason with that regard. We spend a lot of time kind of reflecting. Um, you know, I'll, what I'll do is I'll go back and I'll watch the whole season for last year. I start at the second to last game because I, I never really like to watch that last game until we win the national championship one day. I still haven't watched the – Villanova game still haven't watched the yeah. the Virginia game but I will one day when we when we hold the final trophy but um but yeah we just kind of go back through the journey from last to first and then I'm just thinking of anything that we can do to get better just like individual players try to get better in the offseason coaches are no different you know we're trying to get better each year all right coach know you got uh things to do so get back and uh I might try Tiger King I haven't watched that yet but uh um, I do. I agree that Ozark. You got to kind of stay locked in on Ozark. You fall behind pretty quick. What's your favorite show, Joe? You know, I've been going through. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with an old. I don't know if you're a Seinfeld fan, but I'm, I've been watching Curb Your Enthusiasm, which is a, a kind of an R-rated version of Seinfeld done by Larry David, who did that. So I've been I've been going through that, and uh, we just started watching Hunters too on um, Amazon about Nazi hunters in the in the seventies, and that's been that's a pretty interesting show. Have you, th have you seen this Making of a Murder, Stephen Avery guy? No, I haven't seen that. A good one? Yeah, that's a good one, too. You might check that out. All right. I'll watch you. I appreciate it. All right, Coach, stay healthy. Thanks for having me on. Jayford Roofing Pros. Knowing that your communities have turned to Jayford Roofing Pros to roof your schools, churches, and hospitals, you'll find comfort at home living under a Jayford roof. If you want a quality roof from a local company who will be here after the storm chasers are gone, call Jayford Roofing Pros today. Don't just get a roof, choose a Jayfer groove. The best solution for your business or your home. Jayfer Roofing Pros. All right, welcome back to Typical Tech. We're now happy to be joined by Texas Tech University President Lawrence Skubinek. Uh, President Skubinek, I know you've got so much going on, and thank you for joining us today. But uh, amidst all of some bad news, we get some good news last week, right, that, you, that you're planning on opening up campus in the fall. I think that's good news for most people. Um, there are, of course, some have concerns and reservations about how we're going to ensure the safest possible environment. But a lot of planning has already occurred and we continue to work on the details of the, 
the protocols and the policies and the tools we're going to be using, and we'll be sharing that in the coming weeks. President Skubinek, I was thinking back to um, March when all this happened, and uh, you had come out, you guys were about to meet with the media, and we just found out that they canceled the NCAA tournament and the College World Series. Could you have ever imagined then no. uh, how this was all going to play out? I don't think any of us could have. Uh, you know, um, the other day, I was on a Zoom call, and I asked – the people, do you remember the first phone number you ever had? The very first phone number. Uh, you, you're probably too young to know. No, I know. I, I've got, I remember. Three, four, my five, three, five, four, five. And I said, we'll never forget 470-9391. That's the number we dial into like <laughs> six to ten times a day. This is um, this has impacted everybody. And um, But I, I think the, the, the thing to do is to realize that for those who plan well, and who, look, who are looking into the future, there's opportunities. And I think tech is well positioned for a number of reasons to come out of this stronger than ever. And I believe that to my core. Do you think in some ways, and Kirby and I have talked about this a lot, that this will fundamentally change higher ed or the way students learn? Or do you think we'll get back to just uh, some hybrid of this in the future? Uh, the latter. Um, there's been a lot written in recent years about the end of the residential college experience that days of the ivy covered buildings and all that is is that inefficient so on if nothing else this has convinced me that people choose to go to a certain school because of the culture that they have on that campus and i i, I made this comment in in my memo i sent out last week that um it's the personal connections at tech that are special. And um, of course, I imagine everybody feels that way about the school, but those of us in the Red Raider family know it's very real. And I've heard from parents, I've heard from students, I've heard from faculty and staff that um, the virtual and the remote experience can never provide the full benefits of the personal interactions. So will it change higher ed? Obviously. I think we can have a lot fewer face-to-face -face meetings. And, um, but I believe that if nothing else, it's, it's showed that there's real value in what you get when you go to a campus and, and you become part of that, of that community. You, you, you bring up a good point. I've talked to people like this all the time. We do a lot of work with the college immediate communication and that faculty and that staff, particularly, I'm just taking one out of, we could take any, any college on campus, but really take a personal interest in the students, work with the students. And I do think that's what sets Texas Tech aside from a lot of large universities. But I don't get that a lot of places, right? It does. Um, get um, you, you may have, you may recall that a couple of weeks ago or three weeks ago, there was an announcement that a national survey that um, was organized through the Association of Public Land Grant Universities uh, interviewed more than 300 corporate recruiters across the nation. And Texas Tech came in ninth in that list. Um, and if you look at who is in the top 10, these are very distinguished schools. And we were number one in the state of Texas. We were number one in the Big 12. Not every school was in the survey, but if you look at the schools that they did that were part of that survey, it's like the who's who of higher ed. And uh, for Texas Tech to come out with that sort of distinction, I think speaks to the very point you just raised. Um, th there's a sense of personal connection here. People love this school. Uh, they love their class. The students love their classmates. And it, the staff and the faculty are all part of that. And you can't duplicate that through a completely remote experience. Now, when somebody signs up for the University of Phoenix, that's what they choose to do. But that's mm -hmm. not why they choose to come to Texas Tech. You know, another reason a lot of students choose to come to Texas Tech is one of the many reasons is athletics, right? A lot you'll hear, hey, I want to come to a place where you big time big time athletics. And, and so that's why it's also important to say, hey, what's going to happen uh, this right. fall? I know you're, you're heavily involved with the other presidents. Uh, how important is that for you guys to be on the same page? It's, it's terribly important. And um, to the point you just raised, Robert, before I get back to the immediacy of the situation we're dealing with, 
I, I want to tell you a story, I, I, an encounter I had with a student, uh, maybe it was a year ago or so. Um, I met a parent in Dallas and they said, I'd like you to meet my daughter. She's at Tech. So when I got back to the campus, I reached out to her. She came to my office. I had no idea she was blind. And she was, she was having a wonderful experience at Tech. And I asked her, what were some of the things that influenced you to come to Texas Tech? And she said, athletics. I said, really? She goes, I go to all the football games. I love to be there. Now think about that. Here we have a blind student who wants to be part of that. She feels it. And I think many people feel that way. So um, extracurricular activity, <laughs> athletics are all part of the whole experience here. And we know that we have to get to get back to that. Just last night, I sent some information to the Big 12 office uh, in advance of our meeting this afternoon. We'll have our bi-weekly uh, board meeting today. And they, one of the questions they asked was, do you think it's reasonable to have athletic events on campus if the majority of the courses are online? And I said, the important issue is not the mix that's online and face-to-face, -face, but do you have the proper safety procedures and policies in place. And we know the experience on campus will not be the same, nor will it be in the stadiums when we come back, in the arenas. We can expect that there's gonna to have to be a smaller crowd to respect social distancing. But I think it's really important to have those events. And even for those who can't be in the arenas, they can watch. And that'd be a lot better than these crazy virtual sports they're showing. <laughs> That's you see, you're not watching. You're not watching the video game on, on you know, ESPN or anything. I I used to go to the ESPN site regularly. I don't think I've looked at it for weeks. I mean, what's there to see? <laughs> yeah, not, I I did see that. I mean, you can see some great uh, old video, and then I then. But yesterday, I did see there. We saw two major league baseball players playing a video game against each other. <laughs> and, if, and if, Robert, if you want to watch reruns, go watch the Longhorn Network. <laughs> hey, so uh, you're si is that your office hey, you're sitting in? Uh, tell us where you are there in your house. I'm at home, and um, this is my office at home. I had to push all, this, all the junk off to the side so it doesn't have its usual cluttered appearance. <laughs> but you're doing a lot of calls. Like, you'll have one right after this. I know you'll meet with yes, all the and presidents. Then, and then I'll go into the office. for. I, I'm going to speak to Rotary Club today, and I have several other calls. And um, I go to the office most days. I'm the only person there. So my, my wife still worries about that. But it was kind of funny about this. My wife is on a call downstairs. I'm going to call up here. I said, can you turn it down? <laughs> we have competing Zoom calls. Hey, I want to ask you, because you are such a great, uh, we always talk about how our relationship with you and how important it is because you love athletics. And, and you've been at Texas Tech a while. Do you remember your first ever Texas Tech athletic sporting event? Kind of like, do you remember your first phone number? Um, you know, I came here in 1982. Football wasn't at a peak at that time. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't actually remember much about football, but then basketball started. And I just been at Indiana University where we had won a national championship. I say we, I don't <laughs> feel much of an alliance there anymore. But, and so I remember going to the games and you had to go early to get into the Coliseum. And uh, a lot of times I'd end up at the top of, of the stadium where the smoke would filter up there. Mm -hmm, yeah. And you'd be watching a game through smoke. But I was immediately impressed by the quality of tech basketball because Gerald Myers was, he had great teams. And they played in the style of Bob Knight. And um, I don't remember what happened in that first 82, 83 season, but some of my highlights in the Coliseum was, remember Tony, um, Tony, what's his face? Benford, Tony Benford. No, no, the, the coach for a Oh, Tony Baroni. Yeah, the, the, the little scuffle. We had. <laughs> yes. And yes. then John Cap, Concat coming in with a highly ranked SMU team. And it, it just, there were some wonderful memories there. And I don't remember exactly the details of that. Back in those days, I pretty much lived in my office worried about whether it's going to get tenure but um it, it's uh you're right it, we, i have wonderful wonderful memories of athletic events and i'm sure and everybody else does and we miss it 
we miss it very much. I was talking, I'm sorry to blab so much, but I was talking, I've been calling some uh, alumni and friends just to visit with them. And um, well, everybody knows George and Linda McMahon, wonderful, right. wonderful people. They miss it so much and they miss seeing other people. And like, we all feel that way. What kind of fan are you? Um, you know, you, you see you and Patty at games a lot of times. Are you a nervous fan? Do you do you like to talk during the games? Do you like people to talk to you? How, how do you how do you view a game? Um, Patty thinks I'm a terrible fan because I'll walk into and I'll be at a game and I'll immediately start criticizing the officials. <laughs> she said, "Did you ever play?" And and also when I'm watching it at home, I get really nervous and I have to go for a walk. And she says, what kind of person are you that would do that? I just, I'm a nervous fan. And I just want the thrill of victory and leave out the anxiety. <laughs> yeah, I've seen you before where you're standing and you seem kind of jittery. So I thought you might be classify yourself <laughs> as a nervous fan. Hey, hey, speak to your relationship with Kirby and what you think he's meant. I, I know you guys are very close and hey, uh, we love working for Kirby and just want to get your thoughts on him. Um, Texas Tech is blessed to have Kirby Hocutt as our athletic director. And I think many, many people in this community recognize that, but not just in this community. Um, I was visiting with a president at another university just not that long ago. And we were talking about what's the state of athletics. And, and whenever you talk to somebody outside the university community, they always have to inject that comment. You got one of the best. Now, they won't say the best because they don't want to get back to their athletic director. <laughs> They're probably right. offline they would say that uh, Kirby and Diane are just in the family they are a part of this community um, I very much appreciated the proactive measures he took to deal with the budget issues uh, somebody was I was on a call last week with uh, some in the media and they were asking <clears throat> how will the implications of financial loss and athletics affect the university I go, well not really because they stand alone they, 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 they exist on their revenues, they manage their own expenses. And I really appreciate what the coaches did in foregoing those bonuses. Uh, that's not easy. Before we had you on, we heard from uh, Chris Beard, he was on. Uh, I know you had some great memories from Minneapolis and you've talked about the number of people that have come up to you and talked about that. Isn't that, is that a living breathing example of what athletics can do for a, a fan base and a, an alumni base? It is. Um, we'll never forget it. Nor uh, like we did in uh, when the Lady Raiders won the national championship. Uh, those are moments that are really part of our life or the great catch by Cap Crabtree. We, we have the things in our family we never forget, historical events we never forget, but athletics has a special way of creating moments we never forget. Unlike, say, your calculus class or, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> hey, honey, remember that time I really aced that calculus test? That oh, that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you'd be surprised how people carry that. <laughs> well, you probably did pretty well on a, a few calculus tests in in the in your past. But, I was a uh, pedestrian. <laughs> I did science a favor when I went over into administration. <laughs> As you look ahead in the next couple of weeks, uh, do you see eventually uh, getting back to uh, people coming back to work on campus? Where do you see that? Uh, well, so I had a uh, we had a meeting this week on Saturday with uh, the provost and the CFO, um, just to plan as to how we're going to begin to open the campus. Um, you know, we are in stage four, which is basically a very severe shutdown up until the end of this month of May, but we're already uh, preparing uh, the, the, the paperwork, the application forms that people have to go through. Um, we were communicating about having sufficient PPE and working on all that. We think that starting the beginning of June, we'll begin to allow more faculty to come back, go into their labs, and we, the question that we were discussing at length is when do we make a decision on summer two? And we're gonna hold off as long as we can and still be respectful of those who have to plan to be here. But we would like to see some mix of even face-to-face -face in summer two, primarily for graduate students. Uh, and, but there will be a very, very, robust and healthy offering of online. We, we have to do that. We'll do it in the summer. We'll do it in the fall. 
I was reading something in the Washington Post about things like, hey, taking off door handles and things at, at universities. Are, are we looking at we, all kinds of measures? Robert, in, in uh, total honesty, we haven't discussed door handles. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I mean, you're talking about just change. I mean, staggering. Well, that's classes. interesting. Uh, but we have discussed uh, <laughs> how we sanitize, how we control the flow of traffic in buildings, right. how we might dismiss courses so everybody doesn't flood into the hallway at one time uh, there there's a lot of detail and and i made the comment to provost galleon and cfo slow on saturday we got a heck of a lot of work ahead of us yeah we'll it's not it. going to it's not going to be hanging out at the beach summer you're going to be working all summer president i'm not aware of any beaches around here so it's not a problem <laughs> <laughs> I know you got another call you got to go to, but thank you so much for taking time. Thank, thank you for you, all you do for Texas. Always oh, good to talk to you. Hey, I enjoyed the event Friday night. Yeah, uh, it was great, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Uh, but it's not as good as face to face. No, face to face <laughs> is better, but we appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Thank you, President. Bye bye. Bye. bye, bye, Robert. Well, it doesn't get any more power packed than Chris Beard and Lawrence Skuvenick. Appreciate all that President Skuvenick is doing for us as a university and alumni base leading us through uh, this time of crisis. And so just great to hear uh, from both of those guys. All right, we want to get back to your trivia question. How many wins over top 25 opponents has Chris Beard racked up on the coaching staff at Texas Tech? The answer is 39. Maybe kind of a trick question because you remember, Coach Beard was part of Coach Bob Knight and Coach Pat Knight's staff. Uh, so they racked up some wins then. But uh, Coach Beard now has gotten to the point where he's probably got Texas Tech as part of a trivia question because every time, anytime anybody beats Texas Tech now, generally you're beating a top 25 opponent. But Chris Beard has been a part of 39 wins over top 25 opponents since he has been on the Texas Tech coaching staff. Before we get out of here, I want to recognize Adrian Gregory and the Texas Tech softball team, 13 members of the Red Redder softball team named academic all big 12 so not only were they having a great season preparing for the big 12 they're also taking care of business in the classroom that is typical tech until next week thanks again to chris beard thanks again to president skuvenek we'll talk to you next week i'm robert giovanetti have a great week it's typical tech typical tech it's a touchdown red raider fantastic love it and leave it and they hail from lubbock texas that's pure texas tech